This episode of the Beer Bound Podcast is brought to you by Rolling Hops Beer Tours. Hey everybody, Garrett here from Rolling Hops, as always joined with my partner, Andy. We're here to tell you guys about our virtual craft beer tour offering with what's going on in the world. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to run our historical craft walking beer tour, so we've pivoted to taking the virtual experience of craft beer directly to you guys. Wonderful for team building events, corporate events, even just a, a night out or in for that matter with your friends and family. And we're doing this online. Have any questions about the beer tours or want us to tailor make an event for you? Just shoot us an email or send us a message on any form of social media. Rolling Hops, you can find us everywhere. RollingHopsBeerTours.com is where you can get a hold of us. And we'll see you guys soon. Cheers. Okay, welcome everyone to an episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. We're excited to be joined by Tahas Manzi from Lake of the Woods Brewery. Lake of the Woods is a true institution to the town of Kenora, Ontario. The original brewery dates back to 1898 when the brewery opened its doors to the town's downtown core. Unable to complete with and able to compete with the large macro beer giants of the 20th century, Lake of the Woods closed their doors in 1954. Into the 21st century, the brewery has been revived and then some. Lake of the Woods Brewing Company now has brewery locations in Ontario, in Manitoba, and Minnesota, and I believe maybe one more in the works. All three regions touch the shores of Lake of the Woods. So without further ado, we welcome Tejas to the Beer Bound Podcast. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you awesome. for being Thanks for here. being here. Tejas, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your connection with beer and the brewery? Okay. Well, um, I am a serial entrepreneur, I guess. So I've been involved in a number of different companies in, in uh my career, I'll say. Uh, I actually dropped out of university to start my first company way back, and I'm not sure if I should be dating myself or not, but uh, about 93, 93. So I was at uh, student at Carleton University and met some folks, uh, and we decided to get into uh, IT, and, and um, that's back in the days when the internet was just sort of becoming popular, believe it or not, um, and visual. So uh I, I was involved in IT for a while and um, we moved to Kenora. Oh, I met my wife at school actually at, in university. And um, along the way, I was involved in a candy company, uh, believe it or not. Um, yes, yeah, so I've done some kind of interesting things completely unrelated to beer or, and hospitality. We moved to, my wife's from Kenora and that's sort of how I wound up here. Um, we moved here in 2002 and opened a small inn and then expanded it to a restaurant and uh, got involved in a few other businesses. I had three or four on the go here at one time uh, that were rated, re related to each other and, and unrelated completely. Uh, and then it would have been about 2010 um, or the end of 2009, 2010 kind of thing. Uh, my wife and I were actually sitting down over a pint and kind of saying, what's next, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We were doing all these things, we're busy two kids. Um, and she kind of said, well, I've been hearing a lot about craft beer lately. In, in Kenora and wouldn't that be cool? I mean, wouldn't that be a great thing for the town and help revitalize both the industry and sort of downtown core. I mean, Kenora's downtown was doing this, you know, experiencing the same thing that a lot of downtowns, both urban and rural were facing, which is uh, decentralization, right? Everybody moving out of the core and living yep. in suburbs and that kind of stuff. So anyway, we sort of shelved that idea because had to get back to work and it was busy and had a day job on top of the other companies that we had. So uh, the catalyst really was that one day driving home from work, going from one job to another, heard on the radio that the city had announced they were surplusing uh, the old fire hall in town. So a uh, hundred and, you know, at the time, you know, 105 year old fire hall, basically. Um, wouldn't that be, it was just like a light switch went off and got hit by lightning. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Uh, opening a brewery in an old fire hall in town and uh, finally being able to 
for the public to be able to get in there to that wonderful old building, right? One of the original brick fire halls, uh, 1907, I believe, or 1912, sorry, is on our, our cornerstone. So it's, it's been around for a little while, yeah. Um, and uh, the city was not actually looking for someone to just come in and buy it. They had issued an RFP and they wanted business ideas yep. and they were gonna evaluate that and uh, sort of the, the, the best proposal was gonna win. So we spent uh, the summer building a proposal basically and, and uh, wanting it to be the best one that they got and it ended up being the best obviously because we were awarded the, the RFP and it was kind of at that moment, moment, kind of like an oh shit moment. Like we actually have to do this now and now we have to figure it out. So fast forward a couple of years, it took a while to negotiate the sale with the, with the city and you know, all things dealing with municipality and, and financing and all that kind of stuff and construction and destruction. It took us just under about three years total to get the doors open and ready to go. And uh, that was June 29th, 2013. And we haven't really looked back since. Um, We've just been, like many folks in the industry, kind of trying to figure it out. Um, the interesting thing about our, or one of the interesting things about our company is that up until a little over a year ago, pretty much everybody involved in running the business had no history working in the beer industry. Um, we did, our head, initial head brewer obviously had, had 10 years worth of experience, but he was the only one and he was around for the first seven months. And then after that, uh, we were back to sort of figuring it out. So um, it's been an interesting journey and it continues to be an interesting journey for someone who just, you know, thought it was going to be a good idea and liked drinking beer. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good thing to like. Expansion from just enjoying beer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Can you tell us first uh, a little bit more about Kenora, about the town? Uh, Kenora is the last town or city, city of Kenora, on the Trans-Canada Highway uh, before you hit the Manitoba border. So we're roughly a two-hour drive east from Winnipeg, uh, pretty much the same latitude. Uh, we're Ontario's northernmost brewery, um, so it gives you kind of an idea of where we're at. I mean, there's still lots far to go north in Ontario, don't get me wrong, but uh, the Trans-Canada crosses the border uh, about half an hour from us to the west. And uh, Kenora is a town of 15, roughly 15,000 people on the shores of Lake of the Woods. So uh, Lake of the Woods itself is uh, quite a significant sized in inland lake, I'll say. Uh, there's roughly 100,000 kilometers or 65,000 miles of shoreline. And there's 14,522 charted islands. So it's um, not, you know, not insignificant. It's, it's not obviously Massive. the size of one of the mm. Great Lakes, but for an inland freshwater sort of in the middle of um, the continent, it's sizable. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, it's beautiful here. Um, traditionally, a resource-based economy. So like uh, lots of northern communities, you're either in forestry or mining. Yep. Uh, forestry was the ticket here for many, many years. Um, Boise Cascade, Abitibi ran uh, pulp mills here for uh, pulp and paper for very, very many years. Uh, those are no longer here, obviously. Um, the, and that whole mill site has actually been completely disassembled. Uh, there's no buildings. Uh, well, there's one building that was left standing, basically, that's being converted to its warehouse space. And now there's uh, one industrial company in there. FedEx actually just moved a distribution center from Winnipeg there. So it's starting to see some vibrancy, but it's been years and years and years where basically the property looked like the surface of the moon. So we do have a couple of other um, mills here. <clears throat> One is a Strandboard mill and the other is sort of a more local, uh, well, it was Kenora Force Products. Sadly, um, the ownership group there went bankrupt a few years ago, but they've now been repurchased and they're getting uh, the facility back up and, and running. So employment is a bit of um, an issue, I'll say in, in Kenora, whether, uh, you know, it's, it's a lack of large employers, I'll say, but it's also a, a lack of uh, people. There's not a huge resource pool to draw from. So when you're in a, a human capital uh, rich business, uh, it can be difficult to find folks, especially locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really cool. 
Can so you tell us from from forestry and resource? It's it's now migrated to more tourism based. Mm. So Lake of the Woods has been the you know it gets coined as the Northern Muskokas uh, for years and years and years. So mm. Lake of the Woods is is a huge playground for a lot of Manitobans uh, who come here and with camps on the lake. Um, they call them camps in the north, not cottages. Um, it's just for frame of reference there, term, Thank you. term definition. Yeah. yeah. And some of them are quite significant, right? There's literally billions of dollars worth of net, uh, of net worth on Lake of the Woods. Um, some folks come up for two weeks, some come for a month, some have converted their places so they can come up all year, right? Uh, we have lots mm -hmm. of folks that have places on the lake, uh, on the Canadian side from the US as well. Mm -hmm. And lots from Southern Ontario. So um, a real rich history here of boating on the lake. Uh, this is one of two Royal, uh, Lake of the Woods has one of two Royal Yacht Clubs uh, left in Canada. And um, where I used to live in Kuwait in like five or five minutes from here, I could uh, kayak to that Yacht Club in like 20 minutes. So it's really close to town. Uh, and it's uh, quite the interesting spot mm -hmm. um, or resource. And they're open in the summer. It's nice to be able to go there and have a drink and watch the lake. Amazing. So Lake of the Woods was the original name of the brewery in, 18, in the 1890s, correct? Not true. So the ownership group was... So it, the, what's interesting is the corporation was the same from the start and the corporation changed hands a number of times. So right. as happens, it, it gets renamed, you know, a few different times. So it went from Bent's uh, uh, Abraham kingdom was actually the first uh, creator or owner of Lake of the woods. And then it went, it was, it was associated with uh, Bent's with Drury and then reverted back to Lake of the Woods Brewing Company. So it started and then changed and then now ended as Lake of the Woods Brewing Company. But that minute book exists in the uh, local museum here. So mm -hmm. you don't, we don't really have access to it, but you, it's, it shows the progression of the corporation through a number of different hands and, and getting renamed sort of along the way. But the corporation is actually the original corp. We couldn't reopen that original corp because it went bankrupt in the 50s. However, because the company went bankrupt, the name was public domain. So uh, okay. we created a new corporation. We're, we're able to uh, co-op the name Lake of the Woods Brewing Company, Inc. And um, the interesting about that, the little interesting tidbit about that is when we had this idea and, and heard that radio story and the, and the town was surplusing the fire hall, you know, I called my lawyer the next day and said, I've got this idea, but if we do it, we want to call it Lake of the Woods Brewing Company. And I know there used to be one. Um, what would be involved in sort of being able to get that name? Cause we really, you know, I don't want to call it, um, you know, Lake Rock Brewing Company, or we wanted, we already had the idea that we wanted to bring back tomorrow. So we wanted a name. And he kind of laughed at me and he said, well, I was there uh, and I'm brooding, I'm dating Bruce, my lawyer, but he was, he's like, I was their lawyer in the fifties when they went bankrupt. So I actually have their original <laughs> corporate seal on my desk as a paperweight. I know everything about no, it. And if you want to really? get it for you tomorrow. And I said, okay, we're going to do this. So register it. So the next day we had Lake of the Woods Brewing Company Inc. registered and we were off to the races. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> he was just sitting on his desk. <laughs> I actually, they actually gave it to me oh, two really? years nice. and I'd mention it every so often, but one day I was in there and uh, Rod Suchuk, one of the other lawyers came in and he said, here, I want you to have this. And it, it's that seal. And now it's on my desk and it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, if you've ever seen corporate seals now, they're, you know, this little plastic uh, piece of equipment. It weighs like an ounce or two, really kind of mm. boring. This thing is like, it's a piece of machinery. It's made of solid steel. And, you know, if you could actually get your finger in there, we would crush it in a second. Oh. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Do you really use it for anything formal? Well, once in a while, we're, we, you know, we have to stamp documents. So when we have to seal them, we use that internally, but it's more mm -hmm. kind of a little bit of piece of fun and history and nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So, um, but again, yeah, it's it because it is, we can't use it for official, official legal stuff because it has the other corporation number on it. Our uh, corporate right. is obviously different from that, but still mm -hmm. 
we use it on, um, we do some, you know, fun marketing stuff so we can put it on documents that we're sending out marketing wise. Yeah. Cool. That's nice. You sort of, you know, brought back that piece of history uh, and, and made it new again, which is fantastic. So coming on to, to this podcast, Taras, is, is, it's a bit tough for me only because we like to sort of explore what makes a brewery unique for the most part. But I found so many different things that I want to talk about. I, got, I think I have to try and narrow it down to a few. But first and foremost, I definitely want to talk about Deep Six because <laughs> I think it's something super cool and super unique. Um, where you're and basically... relevant. I mean, it just happened, right? So the, your timing is uh, perfect. Right. Yeah. So you know, I, for the gist of it, you know, from what I've read, you know, you're lagering beer basically under the lake. But maybe you can tell us a little bit more about it. You bet. So um, a few years ago, we, on our search for brewers, um, we got, uh, we were looking basically internationally. We're always looking for folks and it doesn't matter where they are or if, if they're going to fit in the culture and they're going to, we feel that it's going to be a good fit, then we pursue, right? Um, so a gentleman named Chris, uh, from South Africa, um, hunted us down basically through online listings and that kind of stuff. And we started a dialogue and, Anyway, we were successful in sort of courting each other and, and um, we brought Chris over and he's now our head brewer in Winnipeg. Um, Chris came to us with this idea and he said, you know, I, I know of this brewery in South Africa and they, um, exactly that, they lager uh, beer in the ocean uh, for X number of months and, and um you know, it's, as much as it, it is a novelty, it's actually kind of a really cool idea and it you know, they, they attest to the fact that, uh, and obviously the ocean's a little bit different than Lake. However, um, you know, the ocean currents and everything and, and the, and the mm. bottles being massaged constantly, uh, does something to the beer, you know, and depending on style this year is an example of that. Uh, you can do bottle conditioning as well. Mm. Right. And then depending mm. on how deep you start talking about atmospheric conditions, right. And if, mm -hmm. how, or does that affect the beer? And there's, there's, there's camps that say yes and camps that say no. So at the end of the day, we we um, decided that we were going to kind of give this a shot. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Rob DiCucci was one of the partners and our director of marketing has a camp on the lake and uh, we had a Russian Imperial Stout. So he took a dozen bottles of those and dropped them off the end of his dock basically and uh, waited <laughs> till the ice came in, it froze over and Six months later, the ice went out and up came the bottles and we tried them and they all survived. Um, they looked awesome. nice and like they'd been in the lake for six months. You know, <laughs> Rockfish parts and mud and dirt and everything else. And we tried the beer and I mean, it being a Russian Imperial Stout was already, you know, six months old going into the bottle. Uh, pretty, pretty smooth stuff for a 10.1. It just, we loved it. So we said, you know what, we're going to take the plunge no pun intended. And uh, the next year, which was last year's version, so the, the first of the series, we, we redid that Russian Imperial Stout and mm -hmm. did just about 1,100 bottles and had to figure wow. out logistics of how we were going to do it. Um, get, we had to get permission from m &R for land use, obviously. So there, there was a you know, whole series of logistics uh, having to figure out how physically are we going to you know, get this beer in the water Mm -hmm. We had to get a location. Um, uh, luckily, a friend of ours has a barge uh, used for lake construction and whatnot. So he basically said, I'm in, you know, and then a friend of ours is uh, uh, a movie maker. So so he's mm -hmm. all documented. And, you know, it just all these pieces started falling into place. We researched and found some cages that uh, were going to be sturdy and, and um sort of weather the water, they weren't gonna rust, all that kind of, we couldn't have anything fall apart, right? Mm -hmm. And then we also uh, happened to know a local diver uh, because we're talking about beer going down and resting about you know, 16, 20 feet. So you can't do that automatically. Somebody's gotta be down there to be able to disconnect the uh, cable right. winch, right? right? And make sure that they're mm -hmm. sitting relatively even. Uh, they do have tops on them that are wired shut. Um, and that was three crates last year for that Russian Imperial Stout. And we obviously, um, uh, with the beer being at the bottom, we can't, we're not getting it till May, but we uh, we have to drop it in the fall. So that's when we do pre-sales. Mm -hmm. So that year, um, 
those 1100 bottles sold out in just under three days. We had some, <laughs> wow. we had some press scheduled, you know, for that week and everything. And we already had no bottles. So basically we were selling a waiting list for this year's version and knowing that, you know, if, if all the bottles were going to come out and, and were saleable, obviously they're cut, they're wax sealed as well for extra protection to make sure that there's no seepage, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, uh, we had to deal with the fact that lots of people, well, lots more people wanted than 1100 and we could only also because of AGCO regulations, we can only ship in Ontario. Mm -hmm. So being so close to Winnipeg, there are lots of Manitobers who are like, come on, like, how do we get this beer? <laughs> they had to be able to order distance wise and physically have to come pick them up because we couldn't ship them. That said, uh, the bottles came out a little bit later than we expected, just because of, again, logistic issues. We couldn't schedule the truck. We couldn't schedule the crane. Uh, there were issues with the crane. So late May, or I think it might have even been the, just about the first week of June. Uh, we pulled the bottles from the water. Um, I am happy to say that only two didn't survive and they weren't, they weren't breaks. It's just the, the wax seal had kind of broken away from rubbing um, mm. when it was coming out of the water or when it was in the water from the current. Uh, so the, the caps were still good on them mm -hmm. because the wax seal had degraded. We decided we weren't going to sell those. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a couple were broken during packaging. Uh, all being done by hand, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Something gets knocked off the table, away you go, and it's like, oh, that's gonna hurt every time you do that. That's mm -hmm. fifty bucks for that beer. Yeah. We're yeah. waiting. I'm kidding. But we also, knowing that we were probably gonna experience some loss, um, had a bunch of bottles in reserve. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone who you know supported us and purchased a bottle, and some people had bought six or twelve, um, was wow. gonna get. What they were due right so certificates were all printed off balls were packaged and uh, away they go some were shipped lots were picked up and then at that point we had already started planning for deep six this year so uh, that'll be the 2023 batch and that's uh, belgian triple so um, we're using champagne yeast for secondary fermentation in there traditional trappist candy sugar um it's i think it's gonna be a pretty exciting beer uh this guy's 8.6 um should be by all intents you know purposes extremely delicious um we there are bottles left so that's the other thing this year we decided to go big and we did 3300 bottles mm. available for sale yeah, i was reading that that's a lot <laughs> um, the one and the interesting thing about that is that we brewed beer both in Winnipeg and in Kenora for this. So mm -hmm. uh, we then took the beer that was brewed and packaged in kegs in Winnipeg, shipped it to Kenora for bottling, and then um, then proceeded to go in cages that were tracking for Manit the Manitoba batch, mm -hmm. uh, separate cages. And they're all resting uh, at about 17 and a half feet right now. Uh, and that's seven cages. So it was a little bit bigger of a of a deal mm -hmm. uh last year one of the other partners as a construction company and um he has one of those nifty boats that had the front drops down and you can like drive quads right, on, right onto it or whatever mm -hmm. so that's how we were getting deep six to the location the barge actually had stayed at the location and we shuttled uh, one crate at a time uh to the barge this time we moved the barge to the shore, loaded all seven onto the barge, moved the barge, uh, which was actually, it sounds like more work, but it was a lot less uh, to the mm -hmm. location and then dropped uh, the beer, the beer into the water from there. So uh, we're looking at, I think it's a May 15 is our target to pull it out this year. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously it depends on ice uh, on the lake because it mm -hmm. can't just be out of the bay uh, that it's in. I guess I'm saying too much already. People are going to be hunting for it. Um, <laughs> look, current yeah. location, uh, even if the ice came off of that, there's still ice on the lake. You know, it's pretty, it can be pretty dangerous to boot around on the water uh, mm. when there's still ice. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That's, in a boat. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. That's very unique. Kind of like mm -hmm. everything craft beer that we think is unique and fun. Like it's probably one, it's got to be in the top three if not two if not the oh that's first, cool thank like... you i mean yeah. we didn't think of it we just sort of <laughs> made it our own as as is the same with many things right beer styles mm -hmm. 
uh, flavor combinations, that kind of thing. It's, it's what you do with it. And uh, we were very fortunate in the fact that, you know, um, press and people were just really excited about it. So we got a lot of coverage. Even this year, we got a lot of coverage. And um, again, uh, our buddy Matt at Upriver, he does a wonderful job documenting. He's actually had, you know, films at Cannes and TIFF. <laughs> and he certainly makes us look good on film. So um, mm. he made it, he, he's done uh, multiple um, videos of last year's going in, uh, bottles coming out. Uh, this year going in and of course he'll be there next year for uh when these seven crates come out so um yeah it's 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 a bit of fun you know what it, it is beer uh we are um we have to remember that it's got to be fun like mm -hmm. it, at least some aspects have to be fun mm -hmm. certainly uh paying bills never is and all those things and equipment breakdowns and uh, it is what it is but we got to try to have fun Absolutely. So those are, that's one of the things that we get to do that uh, is a little bit of fun, just mm -hmm. like our video, our online videos. Yeah, for sure. But um, I guess just to close off deep six and a little bit of a plug. Yeah. We're about two thirds sold. So we're expecting um, by Christmas, that'll be, that'll be it. And then the waiting list starts mm -hmm. again. Right. So. Yeah. Garrett, we got to get on that list. I want to, uh, yeah, I want to try one. I'm putting, you shipped, I'm put it you on in Ontario, list. right? <laughs> oh absolutely yep. you bet. All right. yeah that's cool and like and I, and I like like you mentioned i guess a lot of it or not a portion of it anyway was brewed um in manitoba and and you know was brought back to the lake i guess that's how you get around a bunch of the laws and distribution you know factors going across provinces i'm assuming well that's just it exactly we have to be very careful right because um agco regulations in some ways are very different than those in in manitoba with lgca so Mm -hmm. uh, and we've met a lot with, you know, licensing and, and the liquor board in Manitoba as well, uh, to make sure that we're on side. And, um, uh, it's important again, just from traceability, they are two different breweries. Um, and we can only sell out of our tap room in Manitoba, uh, what we produce in Manitoba. Right. So mm -hmm. otherwise we use, uh, our, the rest of our, our beer manufacturing in, in Ontario, to supplement that in liquor marts and private beer stores in Manitoba. So mm -hmm. we're really excited mm -hmm. about being there. I mean, that Manitoba brewery is uh, custom, custom made uh, right in the middle of uh, basically a, a 17th floor office tower in huh. downtown uh, Winnipeg. So uh, in the middle, it's true North square. So it's attached to where the Winnipeg jets play Amazing. and uh, cool. The headquarters for Scotiabank, you know, uh, Skip the Dishes is in the building uh, with their headquarters. It's it's a pretty cool place. It's a brand new build. Uh, the building itself is is just over two years, right? Uh, two and a half years old um, from being open and accessible. So, and we built a brewery on the, basically the brewery proper is on the second floor. Our tap room with tasting and retail is on the first floor. The mill is on the third floor. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the services are, are in a mezzanine in the parking garage. Yeah, it was when I say custom build, but we wanted to do it. So again, you know, if you, if you, if you decide you're going to do something, there's always a way to do it. You just have to figure it out. For sure. And that's interesting. Cause I know, like you're mentioning, you have also, uh, um, another location in, in Minnesota, I believe you said, right. That's right. Um, yeah. So was there like a specific push to go, well, one, interprovincial and then two, international? Or is it just because it is simply around the lake as, as almost like a novel? Yeah, I don't think we have ever heard of any brewery going interprovincially and then international. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we do things a little different here. <laughs> if it's hard, we're going to do it. That's like, that's like the mantra. Because otherwise, if it's easy, everyone will do it. No, that's seriously, it. though, uh, when... Going back to first principles, when Rob and I were talking um, about the company and what was important to us and, you know, sort of uh, ideologies, and this is obviously over, you know, don't think that there was tons of planning behind all this. This was over beers going, what, what are we going to do? What, what, what do we think? What, what do we want? What's important? Um, one was the fact that Lake of the Woods is so unique and the fact that that lake touches two provinces and one U.S. state, mm -hmm. and there's an international border that runs right through the middle of it. So thinking about ideas and concepts and possibilities, you know, there was all kinds of stuff. So 
we had always figured that, okay, well, Winnipeg, you know, in Manit Manitoba is half an hour away. Winnipeg is two hours away. It's our biggest, closest market that's accessible. So, you know, one day we're going to be in Winnipeg and not necessarily with a brewery, but at least with beer. So, and then the same thing with, Ma with Minnesota, wouldn't it be great to have our beer in the States and there, Kenora and Lake of the Woods being such a tourist destination for Minnesotans, for folks from Wisconsin, Illinois, the Dakotas, right? Um, mm -hmm. They were already coming, once we had the brewery open, they were coming and experiencing our beer going, how do we get this down here? Like we want, can we buy it in the States? Can we buy it in, in uh, Minnesota? And unfortunately the answer was always no. So the interesting thing really that happened one summer basically, was we were on, Rob and I were on our way to Winnipeg to meet with True North about the potential of uh, a brewery in their new building. And as we're driving, um, my now good buddy, Eric, who uh, runs Lake of the Woods in, in War Road in Minnesota, he's our US partner, along with his wife. And uh, we have a couple other partners down there, our brewer and head of sales. Um, I get this call from this crazy Eric guy. And he's like, you don't know me. I tracked you down. Uh, I'm interested in starting a brewery down here. I think it'll be great. And uh, I'm not crazy. <laughs> Literally, that's that was pretty much the gist of the first 15 seconds. And he goes, I just want you to hear me out. It's a good and way to sign off. You know you're in good I'm, not crazy. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. You're crazy, I'm not crazy. So uh, we arranged to meet, you know, and and, and Rob and I just kind of looked at each other and listened. It's like, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm interested. We, you know, I'll talk to anybody. Where the, you, you can't learn if you don't talk to people. So um, after True North, we arranged to meet with Eric uh, down the, a little down the road. And he came up with Brittany, who's head of sales down there. And they kind of did their pitch and had a few ideas. And he said, you know, I've been wanting to do this for you know, since I moved to the area. And uh, I'm having difficulty because I can't find local help. I, I can't find a brewer. Um, I'm not sure what to do. And I said, well, you know, if ultimately we said, if we're going to do this, you know, we're not going to do it and it's not going to be, um, Joe Schmo brewery, uh, down there. We are in the process of exporting our beer, um, and laying the foundation to be able to do that to Minnesota. So we'll put that on hold. If this brewery that you're interested in doing and us working together on is Lake of the Woods Brewing Company. Uh, in War Road. So, um, you know, fast forward a, a kind of a year after that, the brewery was open um, and banging away, starting to serve local Minnesotans and tourists to the area. Um, the south end of the lake sees an obnoxious amount of uh, tourism coming to the region for hunting and fishing, and especially mm -hmm. fishing in the winter, believe it or not, which was great for us because our busy season is the summer. Uh, the busy season for, you know, true north location is it, because it's downtown is the off season, right? When there's hockey games and um, yeah. everybody's mm -hmm. working down or was pre-COVID and don't even get me started on all that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, is fall, uh, fall, winter, same with War Road. And then we supplement that with all the business that we do in Kenora. We've got sort of a, a, a bit of a what makes more sense from a, um, a sales cycle instead of just when it was just Kenora, it was, you know, feast for three months in the summer. And mm -hmm. then everybody goes away and there's only so much people that are so much beer that 5,000 people or 5,000 households and 15,000 people in Kenora can drink. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, that concept or idea of always of wanting to encircle the lake uh, became a reality with those other two breweries so one way or the other um, we actually have done it with physical locations where before we had thought that we were basically just going to be exporting beer across mm -hmm. the province or across the provincial lines into that state and, and into manitoba so and that's actually how we started manitoba was um you know we didn't we opened in the middle of the summer and we couldn't brew enough beer. We actually opened the brewery without our own beer because we were late, basically. Uh, yeah, that's Lake of the Brewing Company opens June 29th, 2013, and it's all guest taps. <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs> um, 
but we had beer start somewhere, <laughs> but we couldn't brew enough. And then we're in full tilt brewing. And then the summer ends, everybody goes home and we've got all this beer that we have to sell. Mm. So very quickly, right. You have to figure out, okay, who can I sell it to? Well, other local bars and restaurants, because we couldn't make enough in the summer, even to support ourselves, uh, let alone supply anyone. So that first summer we kept all our own beer and sold it. We had, we're, that fire hall is licensed for 275 people over two floors. So it's not small, right? In the summertime, mm-hmm. we have a 55, 60 person patio um, inside, mm-hmm. I think is licensed for 120 with a side fireside room, another 20, and then upstairs is 75 people. So it's not an insignificant spot mm-hmm. um, to be able to pack people in. Um, but yeah, we had to start figuring out how we can sell all, all of our product. And we didn't want to be a seasonal business either, right? I wanted to be year round. We wanted to employ people year round. Turnover's murder. Um, that was sort of what we were about is trying to um, help keep people working. You know, we're very community focused. So uh, I, I believe, you know, you can't have healthy communities if you don't have healthy people in them and healthy people need to be working and you need to provide jobs. So that's sort of one of the things that we mm-hmm. were, we're trying to do here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally makes sense. So, okay. So Tahas, you have three breweries, two, two in two different provinces, one in the U S how does that work in terms of branding? Are you allowed, how does it work in terms of the actual beer styles that you create is each brewery a little bit, is there a nuance to each brewery or do you try to keep things kind of consistent? How do you manage that? as as an administrator hey well you said another dirty word administ- administrator i don't like to think of myself <laughs> as an administrator <laughs> we'll edit uh, that maybe out I, am, I don't know uh but i do help package beer and i do cook in the kitchen and i do sweet floors and there's lots of things that i do instead of just sitting in an office trying to figure out how to how to run mm-hmm. we have a team of people that help us do that but still you know it's nice to get your hands dirty honestly uh sure. It feels good. I feel lately I haven't done enough of that, but we've got a lot on our plate. So um, there's bills to be paid. We got to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You raise a couple of good issues and we, you know, along the way, you kind of stumble here once in a while and and you've you've got, you can't, you got to make mistakes to to make things work or right. Um, So we try, what we learned basically from from all of this is that we try to um, brew most of our cores um, in in kind of one location for the most part until we can get the the recipe down pat. Because every brewer is a little different. They brew a little differently. Every piece of equipment is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, The water is always a little bit different. All these nuances, right, that can affect your style of beer um, or your brand of beer, I'll say, not necessarily the style, but the brand um, and how, you know, it should be, or you think it is. So uh, we have a number of core products in our portfolio. Absolutely. And consistency is key. Um, There's always subtle differences and nuances when you have something in package and when you have something on tap. Right. So um, the, the answer really is that, and this is, this is how we grew up. And this is sort of what will tie in, you know, the, the new story of the day, which has been coming for a little while, which is our new brewery that we're building. But uh, we grew up by uh, co-brewing. So um, uh, our brewery is a 10 hack brewery in the fire hall, our flagship brewery. Uh, obviously, you can only brew so much beer. And within the first year and a half, we were tapped. We were brewing and there's no room to expand. There's nothing that we could do. So uh, literally it's street in front of us, beside us, lane behind us. And then uh, to the north is Copperfin Credit Union. So all the square footage that we have in our building is what we had. And we were, uh, we're, share- we're sharing, you know, a 9,300 square foot footprint with a 275 seat tap room, right? There's no one has room. There is no more room. We were using mm-hmm. offsite storage already, all that kind of stuff. So we uh to be able you know at that point we were at a crossroads do we just keep doing what we're doing and and don't grow um be happy with you know basically running a a brew pub with just a little bit of distribution um or do we see what we can do to to um keep driving the company forward 
because I mean, we were seeing massive growth in demand for the product with, with, with the ability to have zero distribution really, because we only had so much. We didn't have a, a packaging plant, so cans, uh, which are the, you know, even then were the favored uh, format of the day, which is 473 mil. So we uh, linked up with a co-brewer in Southern Ontario. And um, we had launched with one, uh, we're with them for a little while and uh, we're still looking around for the right fit. And we found the right fit with a, with a new plant. Um, and we're actually their first customer. Uh, or their first signed contract. So uh, we've been doing work with them ever since, and they brew the bulk of our packaged product that you'll find in grocery and, and uh, LCBO beer store, for instance. And then even some of that product is exported to Manitoba uh, that you'll find on liquor mart shelves there and um, private beer stores, etc. cetera. So uh, our brewery in Kenora does the bulk of our draft. Um, and then, uh, and, and we just self-distribute from there. Right. So we also do some custom canning, um, uh, out of the location in Kenora in the form of crowlers. So those are the near one liter mm -hmm. size cans that we do in our retail mm -hmm. shop. And we also have a, a bottling machine. So for instance, that's where all the deep six bottles would have been packaged. Um, um, we, there's just simply no room to operate a packaging line there. Uh, we did have one and then realized that if we're going to do all these other things, we can't do this. So, um, that was, that was what we have done, uh, to get sort of to the point where we're at now, which is, um, last year we, we brewed and sold just over a million liters. So 2 million cans, uh, between, you know, uh, between our operations. And we have to also remember that basically uh, Winnipeg was open for one month and uh, then we were shut down for COVID. And we basically uh, were shut down, you know, realistically up until this hockey season. Um, I mean, we could open like lots of other people could with certain restrictions and whatnot, but at the end of it, um, there was nobody working in offices or office towers. So there was nobody downtown, right? So it was, um, uh, we had to pick and choose our hours very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to get us to this point, right? To be able to support that brewery with, uh, and, and all of our customers uh, not being no customers either. I mean, all the on-premise locations that were closed or are, are in various ways, shape or form. If folks could only do takeout while well, they were doing takeout, well, nobody's taking out a pitcher of beer. Um, so yeah, it's been, you know, the COVID discussion I'm sure is going to come up with lots of people because that's what's been happening over the last two years. Mm -hmm. But uh, from a product perspective, yes. Uh, so Manitoba has a number of brands that they brew and some are site specific. So you can, you know, we wanted some uniqueness as well. So mm -hmm. each one of our breweries also brews beer that's only available at that location. Um, uh, again, that sort of uniqueness factor. We, we have a, a, you know, an inside tour where if you travel to visit uh, all three breweries, you get a free t-shirt that says, so, I went to all three Lake of the Woods Brewing Company mm -hmm. locations and I got this t-shirt. I want to get that t-shirt. Um, stuff like that, right? And you can do that now because the border is going to be open in what, a couple of days for tourism. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right. you know, we're, I think we're on the good side of everything now and coming back and, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in hospitality took massive, massive hits over the last two mm -hmm. years. You know, it's been difficult. Um, but I think we've got something here with Lake of the Woods. You know, we're we're year eight going on year nine um, and three breweries. And um, sorry, my point being, I guess, of, of beer and consistency and that kind of stuff is henceforth brewery number four, which is going to be, you know, the large factory brewery here in, in Kenora. Uh, we've acquired a 20,000 square foot warehouse to house um, our, our, our little production facility. And uh, that'll take back the co-brewing that we do um, uh, in Southern Ontario and mm -hmm. bring everything 100% home. You know, you, you, can, you can do things to make, like try to match water chemistry as much as possible, um, constant tasting and, and you know, recipe massages to make sure that that beer is tasting like it should, even though, uh, you know, and our head brewer goes online and brews and monitors 
uh, the brews as they're happening and, and our co-brewer uh, packages them all and then sends them out for distribution or, or pick up, you know, wherever, whatever those instructions may be. And we use lots of LTL and long haul. So we're really looking forward to actually, um, you know, reducing, helping reduce that carbon footprint by bringing everything home and creating, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at probably 19, 20 jobs over two years. So uh, it's exciting. That's great. How many people have actually got the that T-shirt that gone to all three locations? Is it a significant amount, or I guess well, it should no, be prior because, to because COVID the border was closed. The border's <laughs> yeah. been closed for like nineteen months, twenty months. So, uh, prior, was or was it like fairly new, or was it you know sort of? Yeah, so we did prior. that. We dreamed that up a few months after we got Winnipeg open, and then oh, okay. um, uh, because then we had three, and you can circumvent the the lake right by visiting breweries. So, and they're all ours, but. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because each brewery is, is two hours from each other. So driving, if you drive to Winnipeg, it's two hours from Winnipeg, you can get to, um, war road in two hours, and then you can get between war road and here in two hours as well. Hmm. So if you have a designated driver, you can do it all in a day. Uh, <laughs> it'll make for an interesting journey, but you can also get to war road, uh, by the lake. So right. it's about, uh, and, uh, there are actually ice roads that are plowed and maintained in the winter. So you can drive on, an, on the ice road from put in at Kenora all the way to War Road and back. Cool. Really? Like, how do you go through immigration? So uh, believe it or not, there's um, a phone uh, <laughs> in a booth on an island uh, where you actually are required to check in. There's also oh. another one, uh, hmm. Buffalo Point. So if you go that route, it's the same thing. It's basically like a video phone and you call mm -hmm. in and here are my details and this is what I'm doing. And okay, there you go. That's so cool. That's so yeah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Just check in on your own. <laughs> well, it's interesting because uh, there's, again, going back to history on the lake, you know, there's um, lots of, you know, beyond rumors and some confirmed um, sightings and, you know, possible land ownership and that kind of stuff of, uh, back in the prohibition days of Capone and Capone's cronies who would come onto the lake, um, for smuggling whiskey and beer, right. When uh, prohibition was a thing, Canadian prohibition, of course, ended much earlier, uh, than American. And, um, there's, so 10 miles out of town center, there's an Island called whiskey Island. And that's where, like that happened, you know, it was a, there was um, renowned uh, drinking parties and uh, prostitution, you know, a smuggler's haven that almost like our own little pri Pirates of the Caribbean, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And that's actually, it was on that island because it was 10 miles almost to the inch. And um, when the railway was being built across this great nation, um, there was an ordinance that said, I believe that for any work, designated work camp was dry and there couldn't be anything within 10 miles of it so hence whiskey island was born and away you go cool oh <laughs> uh, yeah like sounds like a great island um to can you can you tell us maybe you don't want to divulge this information but in terms of ease and lack of red tape is there a big difference between establishing operating um and producing beer in the province of ontario manitoba and a u.s state such as minnesota oh, yeah. yep some of them are uh, like night and day you know the, the distribution in the u.s is is very very different mm -hmm. um because it's a mandated three-tier system um, where manufacturers are supposed to be completely separate from distributors who are supposed to be completely separate from the last mile, which is the retailer. Um, that's not the same here in Ontario or, um, you know, in, in certain respects, the same in, in uh, Manitoba. We don't have a three-tier system uh, that's mandated sort of thing. So you'll find uh, that brewers can retail their own product, right? Uh, and can self-distribute. So you can self-distribute to a certain extent in, in the US and it depends on each individual state. They're all different. You know, so you're dealing with county law, town law, you're, you're dealing with state law and you're dealing with federal law there. Um, 
thank God we have, you know, a great U.S. partner who helps navigate all of that for the most part. Um, you know, uh, they are very different. So we have to, again, you know, we have to be for, you know, versed well in them. You need to have very good lawyers. Um, sometimes there's things that, you know, you just don't uh, want the liability of without somebody taking a look at. So um, uh, it, I would say certainly it's a challenge, but you have to have a good team, right? So we make sure that we have a good team uh, to help manage all of those different nuances. But uh, you know, shipping, shipping is, is shipping to a certain extent, but it's also different when you're involving distribution. So we have good partners who, who deal with that and help mitigate that as well. Like in Manitoba, for instance, um, we have to use basically a bonded distributor um, to be able to move our product around the province, whereas we don't need to do that in Ontario, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a different setup. So our, some of our distributors here and some of our long haulers also deliver our products to the last mile, right? To the LCBOs or, or to the beer stores, for instance. Um, there's lots of options. Whereas in Manitoba right now, there's not a whole ton of distribution op options. It's changing. Uh, Manitoba is very progressively changing a lot of its um, old liquor laws, I'll say, uh, but it takes time, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes you can be a little bit ahead of the game. Um, I know Eric and his team um, manage the bulk of that for us in, in Minnesota. Um, you know, so just like managing beer consistency can be a challenge. Um, we sort of, uh, our operation in Ontario would be considered like a master. F we're not franchises cause we're all part of the same company, but, um, or in various degrees, but they're all, uh, yeah, it's not a franchise agreement. If anything, there's a, we deal with a license agreement in the U S just because of that's the, based on the laws down there, say, uh, we wanted to be hundred percent owner of uh, a brewery in the U S we're actually precluded from it because we retail our own beer in Canada. So if any part of your operation directly retails to the end consumer, um, product as we do, then we're precluded uh, because of the breach in the three tier system, right? There's a certain percentage of ownership that's allowed. Uh, so yeah, legal bills can be expensive, especially when you're setting this stuff up. Uh, but once you get it down, you know, you've got it down and you can keep continue on business is sort of usual, hmm. although we're very unusual. So yeah, I don't know what that, <laughs> I don't know what usual means, but at least we keep moving forward. Um, I feel like I, your definition of usual is just way outside the norm of, of many others, just for the fact that you like doing things hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm amazed with your ambition to us. Like it just, it's, it's, you seem so well versed and it all seems so natural to you, but from all of our craft brewery owners in Ontario, we hear just how, how colossally difficult it is to to navigate the rules just within one province and you've decided to take on two provinces in a state that's incredible yeah I, I, don't get me wrong it can be a challenge but i you know we decided we were gonna gonna sort of pick up the ball and run and we were gonna set up a co-brewing relationship and start you know dealing with lcbo and learning how to deal with LCBO and, and that's, you know, that can be certainly a challenge. Uh, there are wonderful people there, but they're one of the largest retailers uh, of alcohol in the world, right? So just imagine that. And then they've got all these little craft breweries in Ontario who are cropping up over the last 10, 15, 20 years who all want a piece of you, you know, and trying to get, and trying to get shelf space and all those things. So I get it. Um, mm. We uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we do business with the LCBO? I mean, there's courses, how to do business with the LCBO. So, um, uh, or there should be, if there isn't. <laughs> I was going to say, that'd be interesting. To that's a good idea. Out. Yeah. That's a good idea. Maybe we that's can give fantastic. them. Fantastic. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, but they're a great retail partner for us. Like really, um, we meet with them a couple of times a year and, and give them a plan of this is what we want to do next year. And what do you think? And how do we make this work? And does it make sense? And, 
all those kinds of things and, and, you know, licensing and navigating the whole beer industry is really no different. If you kind of start picking it apart, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, at the end of the day too, we we're beholden to our investors. We're beholden to the banks. We're beholden to all these folks. And, you know, I've signed for the, a lot of that, you know, the other owners have signed for a lot of that. We take it pretty seriously and it's got to work. So, and I, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not a really patient guy. I don't want to wait. So we're going to, we're going to run as fast as we can. That kind of makes sense. And sometimes I'm running too fast and the rest of the team is going, Whoa, 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 wait. Uh, you know, I'm an opportunist. I'm an opportunist. So these things like Winnipeg happening and War Road happening happen because of, uh, we happened upon opportunity and we seized it. We just got to mm-hmm. figure out how to make it work. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not all, it's not easy. Like a lot of it isn't easy. Uh, lots of sacrifices, lots of long hours, lots of work. Um, yeah, it is tough. Absolutely. Like I get it. Uh, other brewers. I'll say too, it's, it doesn't come easy. It's a lot of work and late, late nights writing proposals, you know, cause we need more funding. We need to buy a new tank or whatever it is building this brewery, you know, the budget's blown double already and we're not even close. So mm-hmm. uh, that's, that, that's challenging. And, and again, it's been made even more challenging over the last few years because of the regulations and restrictions that we've been, we've been faced with. Right. So we can't even have people in tap rooms at one point who, to taste the beer, you know, and that's, that's ultimately what moves the product is liquid to lips. People got to, they got mm-hmm. to taste it. There's so much choice yeah. and opportunity to purchase someone else's product out there that the only way they're really going to get on is, is by tasting your product. Ultimately, like all the slick marketing in the world and all the gags and gimmicks, will sell your first can of beer or your first pint. But after that, the proof is in what's in the, what's in the package. So, and I think that's really what ends up bringing customers back again and again is high quality product that you care mm-hmm. about. And people can tell that you care, like whether it's the story that's on the can or the little hidden meanings or whatever it is, it's married with a, a spectacular consistent product in that package um you have the shot of having a loyal customer right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. certainly definitely agree uh, so i think that's a beautiful way to close we've already been 60 minutes um unless yeah, there's I'm any like, i was i was i figured you guys were gonna hang up after like 15 we were gonna be done I, <laughs> not at all just, no like, way it, it went on, by like it. nothing it we was, could probably uh, go for another hour yeah for drives. sure tahas can we uh do it can we schedule a round two maybe sometime in the new year sure let me know i'd be happy to keep you apprised of how the new brewery builds going and what's happening and uh, yeah. i'll see what the little fish have to say about the status of deep six and how they're doing that's right and, uh, yeah it would be I'd, I'd love to this was great yeah for sure it was awesome. uh, a pleasure i think we garrett and i took so much from this we we learned a lot absolutely. and uh absolutely i think after this i'm gonna connect garrett you, you and i can stay on we can order some of the the deep six beer maybe mm-hmm. if, if there's still some put it on the company card yeah that's right there you go sure. right on yeah. i'll uh look for your names on the list absolutely and we'll we'll definitely uh look to make the trip up soon to one of the three you guys are coming like i mean again you know it's uh toronto my best time was 22 hours and that we were flying um uh, it's a long drive but i mean you can fly Mm -hmm. into winnipeg for it's about two and a half hour flight and then it's a two and a half hour or two hour drive here it's not far it really isn't now that uh, you know travel on planes and everything else is back up and running Absolutely. You could probably take a train, but I would say it's probably just as long mm-hmm. as driving. So um, sure. it is a, it's a beautiful drive, uh, you know, over superior or around superior, especially if you go stay along the shore. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but even coming from Manitoba, when you're on the flats of the prairies and then you hit the Ontario border and it's topography, boreal forest, right? Like big mm-hmm. rock and stone. Yeah. It's, it's gorgeous up here. So if you ever get the chance and you're touring Northern breweries, we're just look for the Ontario's northernmost brewery, which is us. Mm, Ontario's definitely northernmost brewery, Lake of the Woods, Tahas Manzi. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to speaking with you again. Have a good day. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.
Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.